So in today's gospel, we hear this uh, somewhat difficult story of Abraham and Isaac. So Abraham was promised by God that he would be the father of a multitude, the father of a nation, that his descendants would number uh, as the grains of sand on the seashore or the number of stars in the sky. And he has a son through his slave girl, Hagar, and he has a son eventually through his wife, uh, Sarah, as well. And that son is Isaac. So Isaac is the how would you say, his first, we'll say, official, legitimate son sort of thing, uh, so that he'd be the one to, to, to carry on his inheritance. Okay, when this happened, Abraham was 99. Okay, so he was no spring chicken anymore. Uh, when the Lord appeared to him uh, and spoke to him and asked him to, you know, be circumcised and so on and so forth, uh, then he would have had Isaac at about 100 years of age. Okay? So again, fairly well on in years. So, you know, the possibility then to have other heirs, to have other children, like it's all getting fairly narrow. So it's, uh, we just have to keep in mind what the point of this from God's perspective is. We'd be very, very clear about this, okay? Is God in any way advocating child sacrifice? Absolutely not. Let's be really, really clear on this, okay? Absolutely not. What the Lord is showing here, what Abraham is showing, is the enormity of his faith. How on earth can I be the father of a multitude if my son, my, and it even says here, my only son, on two or three occasions, your son, your only son, uh, how can I be the father of a multitude if my son Isaac is no longer with us, right? If he's sacrificed, how on earth can God come good on his promise to make me a father of a multitude? It's just, it's not, it's not, it's just, it's actually, sorry Lord, but it's just actually not possible, even, even for you. How, is it, how, how can this be? How can it be both? How can, I've clearly understood I'm supposed to sacrifice my son, and I've clearly understood you say I'm going to be the father of a multitude. This is just, it just, it, just, it can't be both. It can't be both. Oh, I just, I don't understand. But Lord, if you say so, like, it's so counterintuitive. If you say so, I will do it, right? So this is a, an enormous test of faith and an enormous act of faith, okay? I, that I can still be the father of a multitude, even though, at a, okay, he was 100 when Isaac was conceived, uh, not when all of this happened. We don't know exactly how long it was afterwards that, that this uh, particular event happens. Now, a couple of little points and details. Uh, which are always important. Uh, take your only child, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will point out to you. Uh, it skips a couple of verses here uh, in, in, in today's reading, but scripture goes on to say that Isaac himself carried the, one, the wood for the sacrifice. Okay, so the wood for the sacrifice is mounted on him. Now, considering how much wood you're going to need to burn a sacrifice of that size, it's quite a lot of wood. We're not talking a couple of twigs here, okay? So a lot of more modern scripture obser observers and commentators are saying that it's actually quite likely that Isaac was at least a teenager, if not more, okay? So he's, he's a young man in order to be able to carry, I mean, sure, any of our little friends who we know uh, little brothers and sisters, I mean, how much firewood can they, can they carry? Well, sure, I mean, they'll carry one, they'll drop it, they'll leave it behind. Oh, I don't know where I put it. I mean, you know, so, so, like, so it's, just, it's not going to end well, right? So he had a big chunk of wood, uh, you know, like lots of logs, okay? That's not, you can't give that to an even 13-year-old, 14-year-old. Like you're going to have to be 16, 17, 18 before you'll be able to carry any decent amount of wood. Point being, when it comes to Isaac being bound in order to be, to be sacrificed, Isaac, strapping 18-year-old versus 118-year-old daddy. Dad, what are you doing? I'm binding you for the sacrifice. No, you're not, Dad. <laughs> and that would be the end of it. So a lot of modern commentators are saying, actually, that, that Isaac was willing to sacrifice himself, too, on the command of his father. Okay, and again, this is a foreshadowing of Jesus who willingly lays down his life. No one takes it from him. I lay it down. Okay, so like the Old Testament, New Testament being brought together again. 
Isaac who actually lays down his life if that's what his father wishes. You know, so again, it's a, a, a testament to, to the, also to the faith and fidelity of, of Isaac. Okay, so it's, it's, it's quite a, again, it's, it's, it's an uncomfortable reading, you know, because for all of you parents out there, you know you'd never do this. But again, Abraham, bottom line, Abraham doesn't go through with it. The angel stops him and says, this is, okay, okay, I've seen your faith. I don't actually want you to kill the child, Jeannie. Okay, stop. We're all good. There's a lamb. Take care. You know, that'll, that'll do. Do your thing. Sacrifice the lamb. Okay, now it must have led to a seriously awkward conversation on the way home between Abraham and Isaac. So, how about that weather? <laughs> what, what do you say on the way home from that one? Like, Dad, you know the way you were holding up that knife over my head? <laughs> uh, but, okay, point being, Abraham proves his faith. I, uh, Isaac proves his, his willing to, willingness to sacrifice himself. Uh, and God does come good on his promise. His promise being to bless Abraham, to bless Abraham, right? This idea of blessing, you will be blessed, which means like, you know, God's presence in you, around you, God's, God's will guiding you. You know, Adam and Eve had God's blessing. It's lost in through original sin, Cain and Abel, Lamech, all the mess uh, that ensued afterwards, the flood then to, in order to purify things. Uh, Abraham... Uh, so Noah and his family saved. Okay, off we go. We're up. Fast forward a couple of generations, and we're up to today's story: uh, Abraham, Isaac, and then his grandchild Jacob, i.e., Israel. Um, all of all of the story, like showing God's desire to bless us, and man's either unwillingness to receive God's blessing or his willingness to choose other things along with God's blessing, to choose sin, to choose idolatry, to choose other things, and still want God's blessing. But it doesn't really work that way. I will be your God and you will be my people, but I will be, I must be your God. You must choose me. Again, the humility of God to say to us, you must choose me. Sure, there is no other. <laughs> Anything else is made up. Any other divinity simply doesn't exist. So choose me, reality, or fantasy. You know, but some people do choose fantasy, choose a God of their own making. It's easier. Fills somehow that spiritual void, kind of, but never sufficiently. So we fast forward then uh, 18 centuries, and Jesus comes on the scene to show us the, the absolute fulfillment of, of, of the promise, the absolute fulfillment of this blessing, right? That it isn't about establishing a, like just a tribe or a nation or a kingdom. It's not about geographical boundaries anymore. It's not about establishing a kingdom in the sense of, you know, a walled city like Derry uh, or something like that. It's, it's not about that anymore. It's something so much bigger. It's about establishing a kingdom here in our hearts, not confined by geography or politics. A kingdom that can exist anywhere and everywhere. A kingdom where the Lord rules in here, in me, in my choices, in my will, in what I want to do, in what I give my time to. The Lord rules in this kingdom. And the Lord is, is more than, than just a mere man. Uh, I was talking to someone recently and uh, they spent a bit of time trying to convince me to to offer maybe more uh, mindfulness to our young people here. And I was like, Jenny, where do we start? Like, where do we start? <sighs> okay. <laughs> like the idea of mindfulness where, you know, you become aware of your surroundings and aware of yourself and kind of empty your mind and empty your thoughts and, you know, become a, just at peace and at one with, 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 with all that surrounds you. You see, what, what's, what's missing from that? There's a couple, well, a couple of things. A couple of things. Number one, as Christians... Okay, as Christians, all of our prayer must be Christ-centered. It's really simple, okay? So Jesus must be at the center. Jesus, the Trinity, God the Father, the Holy Spirit. Okay, you get the point. God must be at the center. So any spirituality where, where God isn't at the center isn't Christian. So, you know, becoming aware of my surroundings and becoming at peace within myself, that's nice. That's called relaxing. Okay, yeah, that's, it's not prayer, you know, it's not prayer. Now, all of us, like, you know, from Eucharistic Adoration as well, it's good to have, like, moments of silence, yes. But the focus isn't the silence. The focus is filling that silence with God, not filling the silence with nothing. 
Nothing gives nothing. You know, nothingness doesn't give you peace or grace or anything like that. Nothing gives nothing. So we try to, you know, quieten our hearts, yep, and trying to remove our distractions and have some, some nice music on occasion and, you know, some repetitive prayers just to, to help us to enter into a, a spirit of prayer to unite ourselves through Our Lady, uh, to, to, to the heart of Jesus, or through meditating Jesus' passion to him. But the goal is that we get filled with him, not that we get filled with nothing. Nothing brings nothing. Nothing is useless. Okay? So we get filled with God. So uh, if, if this was a, a, a valid Christian prayer, we would find it in either sacred scripture or tradition. So sacred scripture, the Bible, tr tradition, these, these well-known, tried and tested, um, either from private revelation or based on scripture, these other forms of prayer, you know, your, your bravery, rosary, divine mercy chaplet. God would reveal it. Did God reveal mindfulness? No. End of story. Done. It's, it's, it's not Christian. It's, so it's not going to fulfill my spiritual needs. It'll be nice. It'll be relaxing. Okay. But we don't need just simple relaxation. We need God. We need God's blessing. They needed it in the Old Testament. We need it in the New Testament. And God reveals himself then in Jesus Christ today in the gospel, for example, when he's transfigured, he gives us a glimpse of his divinity. So you have this, this man who is no mere man, even though that's the way he looks. Obviously, when people met him, I'm sure he looked relatively tidy, and I'm sure he, I was going to say, I'm sure he shaved on a regular basis. I'm sure he didn't shave on a regular basis. I'm sure he, you know, he was presentable, right? He was presentable. Uh, and I'm sure he was very pleasant and that, but looking at him, I don't think you saw his divinity. I think even his apostles didn't see his divinity. Now, they would have often seen, I think, something, sim I don't know how, if they could have explained it in words, something very special about him. I mean, they're there mending their nets. Jesus looks at them and says, follow me. And they say, okay. I, I mean, there must have been something fairly special. There, was like, there wasn't a long debate here or anything. They drop their nets and go after two words, which might even be one word in Hebrew, I don't know, but point being, it's very few words. Uh, you know, so there must have been something very special about him, but did they see his, his divinity shine constantly? No, I don't think so. Do we? Not really, no. Like when you go to Eucharistic Adoration, you don't see intense light, you know, smoke, angels, um, heavenly music, you know, the, the, the choirs of angels, and you, you don't see that in Eucharistic adoration. His, his, his divinity, it's, it's veiled. It's there, it's there, but it is veiled. So it's, it, he, he's truly God and he's truly man, but we don't necessarily perceive that, see that, but it's still true. It's still true. So on occasion, like maybe we will get glimpses in our prayer of you know, real satis real, a real kind of a spiritual satisfaction or a, um, a light in our hearts. When, when we find ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And he will, I think, give those on occasion. But very often we walk by faith, not by sight. So today's gospel tells us about the transfiguration. And it's, uh, on one hand, a, a beautiful moment. Lord, it's good for us to be here. I don't want to leave. Let's build three tents. Let's stay here. You know, one tent for you, and one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not even a tent for us, by the way. They didn't build a tent for Peter, James, and John. Peter wasn't saying, we'll, we'll have a tent as well. We'll just stand here and look at the three. This is amazing. I don't want to leave. And at the same time, then this cloud comes over them, and they're, they're, they're frightened. And that's really important. So while it's, on one hand, it's, you know, the, the, original, the origin of the word awesome, to be awestruck. They're like, there with their gobs open, just going, that's, that's, the same Jesus that we saw 10 minutes ago and just look at him now. It's like just, whoa, just you know, radiant and glowing. And do you know, this is like, you know, and, and then I don't know even how they knew that it was Elijah and Moses. I mean, they'd never seen them, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there's this, this, the, the, like, this is just a supernatural moment. Let's, let's stay here. And then the cloud comes over them and they're frightened. That's important because we must never get used to God. We must never get used to adoration or prayer or any of these things. It's, oh, it's just the rosary, it's just adoration, it's just mass. Uh, we must never get used to these things. And hopefully, this could be a positive fruit of, of the lockdown as well. When, we, when you all get to do, when you all get to go back to mass, to do so, like just absolute awe. Lord Jesus, I've missed you so much. I've missed the Eucharist. 
I've missed receiving Holy Communion so much. And to, 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 to be receiving the Lord with a kind of a holy, a holy fear and trembling. Not fear that the Lord is going to reject us, but anything but complacency and it's just Holy Communion. It's good for us to have this like little sense of fear. And, and Paul, like, I'm not, again, not afraid of being condemned, but like, it's like meeting your, your, your hero, your biggest, uh, the biggest influence in your life ever, you know, some great author, or politician, sports person, whatever it is. You're really excited to meet them and then you're kind of afraid you're going to mess up or trip or something as well. You know, you're kind of, it's, it's excitement and kind of fear all mixed. That's the way it should be for us with the Lord, you know, like to never get used to it. You know, to never be sitting in the church, it's kind of, it's all about me, my relaxation, hum, inner peace. It's not actually about you at all. It's about the Lord. It's about him. It's about him. And he is the one, like, who, who forgives us and loves us and dies on a cross while we are still sinners. So while we have rejected his blessing and said, nah, no thanks, I'd rather do something easier. That's when he dies for us. Lord, it is good for us to be here. It is good for us to know you. It is good for us to pray to you. And everything else, Lord, is just made up. Just let us renew our prayer lives. Let us renew our love for you, Lord, truly God and truly man. Veiled, hidden in the blessed sacrament. Lord Jesus, we pray for our priests too and for a renewal of the priesthood. Lord, for priestly zeal and priestly love for the Eucharist to be renewed. We pray, Lord, for those who are called to serve you at the altar. Lord Jesus, may they do so as servants of this great mystery. Amen.